My name is Larry Clemens. You're at the Clemens Carbon Farm here in Steuben County in Indiana. That's in the northeast corner of the state where Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan come together. And we're in the Western Lake Erie Basin watershed here. This farm, my wife Mercedes and I bought uh, in 2000. It's approximately 50 acres. Uh, we call it our carbon farm now because 20 of the 50 acres was a farm field that we farmed for many years. We started to have a few of the tiles give us some problems and start to break down. So we decided uh, to slowly convert this into a, a carbon farm. And so we're growing trees, we're growing prairie. Our latest addition was this project here where we use the Conservation Reserve Program to restore wetlands. And so all of this farm now is back into wildlife habitat, forests, and trees, and a small prairie. On most fields, productivity may mean producing a crop. But for more marginal pieces of ground, it may be about capturing carbon, storing water, reducing erosion, or providing habitat, or just not losing money. We all know with the technology we have in our tractor cabs and our combine cabs nowadays, we, we go across the field and we can actually measure what areas are being productive for us, what areas are costing us money to farm. And, and quite honestly, even before we had that technology, most farmers knew that as they were going across the field and now the technology simply confirms it for them. And I think we have to really look at those areas and going back to that notion of rights and responsibilities as landowners and, and land users is are those areas that aren't productive, are there better uses for them? Retaining water, uh, creating a little wildlife habitat, some pollinator habitat, different things like that, that quite honestly are really needed right now for our local communities, and our overall natural world health. Carbon farming doesn't only mean replacing marginal crop production with wetlands or trees. Retired USDA ARS researcher Jerry Hatfield points out that carbon sequestration is part of the energy cycle of crop production. If you think about the process of putting carbon back in, that is an active process. <laughs> you have to have a growing plant <laughs> that takes and photosynthesizes, makes a simple sugar, takes and transports part of that sugar down into the roots, and then would some of it gets leaked out that feed the microbes. Well, that's a pathway of carbon going back into the soil. And, and we can't do that without a living plant uh, on the system. Uh, you can do it uh, a little bit by adding manures on because those are carbon based. Uh, but, you know, it's really an active plant process. That energy flow produces more than just carbon or just crops. It creates better soil, and that's a benefit that can be felt downstream as well as on the farm. If you look at that, it, it really revolves around our whole energy flows. And we don't think about agriculture in that context very much, but in reality, that's, that's what it is. And if we think about why this is so important today is that we have continued to reduce our organic matter in soils. We've degraded those soils. We've made them more vulnerable to the, the current climate regime that we have with these uh, increasing uh, intensity of storms, this increasing frequency of drought, all the other things that are going on. And so bringing carbon back into the soil helps restore that functionality, uh, you know, just on the whole agricultural complex itself. So how much carbon can an acre of cropland sequester? Well, estimates range from about one third of a ton to one ton of carbon per year, but it's complicated. Well, we know that practices such as no-till and cover crops do increase the amount of carbon that is sequestered in the soil profile. But what we don't know is how much carbon is sequestered in the soil in, under particular rainfall conditions, for instance, and also as a function of soil type and other management factors. And so what, there's a whole body of research right now that's being collected to try to better understand how practices, weather conditions, soil type, all result in the amount of carbon that's actually sequestered in the soil profile. Understanding the potential of agricultural soils to sequester carbon is at the heart of the latest wave of carbon credits, paying farmers for the carbon they remove from the atmosphere. Ryan Stockwell is Senior Manager for Carbon Grower Engagement at Indigo Ag. 
That means he's heading up one of the leading carbon credit efforts on the market today. Stockwell describes what buyers are looking for in order to pay farmers to sequester carbon. When it comes to the pricing of carbon credits and the overall return, I think we have to look at a a number of components. So one is, what is it that buyers are willing to pay for, for that carbon credit? And I think there are some important characteristics that to, to make that happen. So one of those is the overall quality of the credit. And what I mean by that is the amount of data that is tied to that carbon credit that they are receiving what they are buying. And so the more data and information we can provide to verify that credit, to prove that that had occurred, the higher the value of that carbon credit in the market. The value of sequestering carbon is far more than the annual cash payment from selling a credit. I would recommend for any grower that's looking at the carbon credit market to to keep some perspective here. There's some value there, yes, but oftentimes the way that, that I like to say is the carbon credit, that's the icing on the cake. Take a look at the cake as well, that when you're adopting these practices, you're getting reduced costs, you're getting problem solved. Uh, you know, anything from improved drought resistance in the West and, and arid regions to improved moisture management and drainage in the humid regions. And, and so that, that can make or break a season for you farming. And you only have 40 chances. And if you lose a few by not having these best tools in place, that's, a, that's really important. So take a look at the cake and not just the icing. Cynthia Ribeiro heads up the Bayer Carbon Program. She points out that verification is a vital step to creating value from carbon credits, so buyers know what they receive for their money. Until recently, verification was an expensive, time-consuming process of soil testing and record keeping. New remote sensing tools promise to make the process faster, easier, and cheaper, which leaves more money for farmers in the value of a credit. Regarding the benefit for the farmer for the remote sensing, I think it's the hands-off kind of activity, right? So knowing that I can go about, focus my time on what I need to do with farming as opposed to, you know, going and contracting an auditor to come in and verify that I'm doing things. And, and of course, I mean, there, there will be opportunity for farmers to engage with 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 partners if they need to, if they need help, if they need assistance, but ultimately want them to spend their time in, in the adoption in, in successfully farming and we can do the operations. So we're trying to minimize the operations on the farmer side beyond the adoption of practices. Um, the ability for us to, to in, use climate field view and ultimately farmers that can have the fortunate to be able to use um, if you view drive, uh, which will allow the machine co- data collection automatically, ultimately simplifies. And again, it becomes that hands off the, the, I don't have to worry about this. I sign up, I, I do my practice. I collected, collect the data instantaneously, and then ultimately get my pay at the end of the year. Entering into a carbon credit program is like signing any other kind of contract. You really need to understand what you're getting into. One of the fundamental differences between programs today is what the farmer is being paid to accomplish. How exactly, what are they scoring you on? Are, are they paying for a practice or are they paying for what you produce and what you earn in terms of carbon sequestration? Typically, the more complicated, the more specific to output or outcome, the more accurate will be the system and the more trusted will be the credit generated from that system. So over time, that value will continue to go up as opposed to probably going down in that system if the buyers just don't have that confidence in the credit itself. And thirdly, would be, again, looking at the, the intention of that, of that market. Are they creating credits for their own need or are they looking to which in that situation, they're gonna be looking to get the cheapest possible credit, or are they working with 
with growers to create the highest value credit to maximize that return to growers. So I would, say, I would suggest looking at the intention of that market as well. In the Bayer program, the payment is for adoption of specific practices. Cynthia Ribeiro says the company chose that route to make the program easier for growers and to keep it in alignment with its commitment to driving low carbon agriculture. If you look at the way we developed our program, it's that we want to pay farmers on an annual basis because they do have their expenses on an annual basis. We pay for the adoption of practice. So while we are ultimately interested in the carbon sequestration, we remove that variable from, from, the, from the game, from the farmer perspective, so they don't have to worry about how much carbon they're sequestered. They're getting that fixed income. Other key factors are escape clauses. For example, not getting penalized if a drought prevents you from establishing a cover crop that's in your contract, and whether your payment goes up if the value of the credit increases. But one of the most important and controversial elements is called additionality. Dr. Ribeiro explains. So the incentive is geared towards adding new practices into, into the into the game versus, you know, just rewarding same old because otherwise you're not changing anything. If you're just paying for for the farmers that are um, doing this for years, ultimately our emissions remains the same. If we bring new farmers, you are really changing the, the amount of emissions. You're sequestering more carbon. Soils can't just keep absorbing carbon forever. After a few decades of good management, scientists think they can become saturated. That means that no-till and cover crop pioneers may suffer because their soils may actually be too healthy to sequester a lot more carbon. There's been a lot of thinking about how to ensure that new carbon is being taken out of the system without closing off growers who have long been committed to conservation. So what we are doing in Bay Area is that last year we were only only new new adoptions, but this year we are accepting since 2012 because now we are we understand that likely those soils have not reached saturation. So anybody that have started since 2012 is allowed is eligible to enter the program. The other thing is that we we are envisioning as part of being able to bring in new farmers is the. Um, com- adding new practices, right? So if you're already no-till and cover crop in the future, what else can a farmer do to be able to potentially sequester additional carbon uh, that would allow him to participate in this, in this marketplace? Um, oftentimes, when we take a look at the nitrogen management, there's a way that we can make some tweaks and they can fine-tune their application timing or rate Um, and that will generate a a credit. Another area that we often um, miss uh, until we take a look at an individual operation is how they use cover crops. Those cover crops, you know, when we say cover crops, most people think just one system and and one, one simple concept, but there are a lot of variables within that. You can plant them earlier, You can start interceding them into standing crops. You can terminate them later instead of terminating them at at planting, maybe five, six days after planting. You can also increase the the diversity of those cover crops, which we found will increase carbon sequestration. So carbon credits and incentives represent an exciting opportunity for farmers and landowners. And carbon itself is worth even more. What I've been telling producers is let's, let's consider what carbon is really doing. Uh, we can put carbon back into our soils and we can influence CO2 levels in the atmosphere, uh, but we're going to have to have a lot of producers do that in order for we to see that benefit. However, if you begin to put carbon back into your soil and the practices that go with that in terms of being able to sequester that carbon reducing tillage, the cover crops, the crop diversity, the use of uh, manures and all of this, uh, you know, as we think about the regenerative ag piece, is that there's a value to carbon that's way beyond the carbon market. Uh, Because we have seen when producers have gone to reduce tillage and cover crops, is that we're seeing that they've increased the profitability of their fields. 
uh, because where they're taking the low yielding parts of each soil out within the field and, and the fields are becoming more uniform. Uh, so that we're seeing that particular piece of it. That value of carbon can be as much as anywhere from 75 to $150 an acre. Uh, so now we're talking real money <laughs> in terms of this. So I'm trying to get producers to understand that there's a value to carbon for them that they can see that, you know, because they always say, well, if I, if I put my farm in, you know, what, what's going to be the impact on the global environment? And I'll go, well, not much. But, uh, you know, on your farm, you can have a tremendous impact. And, and it's a tremendous impact on your efficiency, your, your profitability, your climate resilience, all of these things that are yours and monetize for you what's happening. Uh, and, and trying to get them to understand that there's a value to carbon. Uh, in all of this.